Good evening, all at the College of Complex, Saturday night, one day before Christmas Eve. This is the College of Complex, Complexes. This is Saturday night, December 23rd, and we are ready to start the program. Let's welcome Margaret Goldstein to the lectern. Her speech is entitled, In a Society with Endless Choices, Why Are Harmful Ones Being Made? Her premise is, what does it mean to have a society of endless choices such as ours? Why do we have such a society? Why are the harmful choices being made by households, consumers, mothers, the business world, and our car, car drivers? Let's welcome again, Margaret Goldstein. Well, you already know what the topic is. Of uh, so many choices. One reason is the 1960s revolution where all the old traditional rules of behavior were thrown out and replaced by the idea that um, all that mattered was doing your own thing. Another reason is that business thinks it can make more money by constantly coming out with new versions of everything encouraging us to keep buying and spending to keep up with the latest thing or newest choice, whether or not it makes any sense. Our selfishness culture, which says we should have everything we want, everything we want, so we have to have endless choices. You can't go without one thing that you want because what you want is all that matters. Politicians, giving the impression that we are entitled to all sorts of handouts so that they can then get elected by giving these handouts uh, in the form of tax deductions, tax credits, and uh, questionable benefits. Little wonder we have a $20 trillion national debt. Much of that is um, attributable to all these goodies that are given out. They're costly. So what are the consequences of so much choice? It is now a choice for mothers of small children to work rather than stay home with their children despite possible emotional damage to such children by not having a single figure to bond with. This is a kind of a basic psychological principle that this is what children need so they have a sense of security. It is a choice to have taxpayers pay for things like daycare, which are less than desirable, which in my opinion is actually a way, a bad choice of how to spend taxpayer money. There's also the choice to bear children whether or not there is a father in the picture. Despite the known damage, emotional and developmental to children by not having fathers in their home. And I do believe the figures now for uh, children born out of wedlock is about 40%. It's, it's shocking. It is now a choice to eat oneself into obesity with all standards of looking trim and dressing tastefully being thrown out the window no longer matters how one looks. And uh, so what we have now in the U.S. is a 70% overweight, 40% obese, and you know what kind of health problems that's leading to. It is now a choice for moderate and middle income people to save money for a rainy day and retirement, or later have the government bail them out with food stamps, 
health assistance, I'm sorry, eating assistance, tax deductions and credits. Think of the mortgage um, uh, interest deduction, all those bad things. Housekeeping assistance and daycare costs. Those 30 percent of those of people over 55 have no savings and also no expected pensions beyond their social security. This is living dangerously. You think you're going to live solely on social security when you're over 55? You're dreaming. Typically, 40 to 55 year olds with household incomes of $75,000 to $100,000 have only $70,000 in your retirement fund, you know, a 401k, something like that, and $12,200 in regular savings. Incredible. Where does that $100,000 go? This isn't going to prepare anyone for life's exigencies. And this is <clears throat> repeatedly pointed out in news articles, if I've read this once, I've read it 20 times, what a serious problem this is. That people will not be ready for their old age, for what comes up, or even for a rainy day. Also, three-fourths of people die with outstanding debts. The business world has now made it a choice not to primarily serve customers, or the economy, or for government revenue needs, or employees, or the environment, but to almost exclusively focus on bolstering profits and thus stock prices. Profits, money, that's all that matters. Examples abound of poor customer service from not being able to get through a phone system to get a matter dealt with, to watching more commercials on TV than actual programs, to the terrible service experienced by airline passengers. What about global warming choices? Is this a problem, global warming? We should do something about it. The largest source of global warming emissions is transportation. Yet even those those who have an alternative to driving a car, such as Chicagoans, where there are extensive public transportation, continue to drive in droves, frequently as single occupants of a car. Making better choices in this context would really make a difference in not increasing our extreme weather any further than it is. It has been made extreme. I think this is a real problem and people have to stop thinking just of themselves and think of the environment and something, think of something bigger than yourself. That's what we have to do. This is the end of this presentation. Uh, somebody here asked me to bring copies of two books I've written and uh, so I'm going to two of them for that person and uh, these are for anyone uh, that would like them as a complimentary copy. Making decisions that don't harm others and the selfishness system, why society is overwhelmed with problems. That concludes this presentation. Okay. All right. I'd like I'd like to give the first question, Margaret. Mm -hmm. There's an economist mar uh, by the name of Johann Norberg. He wrote a book called Progress. Can you make a little louder? Please? And he said uh, he wrote a book called Progress. And he says things are good by any measure. We're living longer. We got a lot more wealth. There's a lot less people dying from infectious diseases, and that by any measure, society is actually getting better. Can you comment, please? I absolutely agree. You know what it's like? You know what it seems like to me, Tim? It seems like we don't, we're up, I'm sorry. We're up. 
we're up on this pinnacle. Everything is almost perfect. Now we're on the way down, and I don't know why. I would think people would be so thrilled, like you say, compare yourself with how people lived even in the 1930s or so. I mean, we're, we're living marvelously well. We're all lucky. But that isn't... People act as though that's not, um, you know, they're indifferent to this. I mean, they're always complaining, but the fact is, I mean, and people, have, and they have this, but they're shooting themselves in their foot. They have this wonderful stuff, and I mean, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but um, with um, weight things and stuff, I mean, to damage their own health when they could be living a marvelous life well into their 80s, you know, I, I don't know. I agree, on paper it looks like we, we have made a lot of progress. I mean, we have. But I guess because human nature is so impossible, but, but, that overwhelms all the, good, all the good infrastructure we have. We have wonderful infrastructure in this world. But I has, mean, has it then always been the case, though? I mean, even Jesus Christ mentioned the problem of, of the lower human or the sinful character of man. Yes, but I think, I, I think maybe we've gotten this far. Why don't we try for trying to do something with human nature? I mean, forget the gadgets, forget the inventions, just work on human nature. It needs a lot of improvement. And, and what would be the best way for you to improve it, then? Oh. Just curious. I, I have tried and tried, and I, I don't have any... I, I have seen no, nothing working. Nothing. Look, look at how religion... Look at churches, look at synagogues, and what of that. I mean, you go to church, they talk about love your neighbor and all that stuff. What, what happens when these people leave church? You know, it's... I don't know. Okay. Next question, please. Well, I think one of the things you listed in your uh, was uh, about the uh, the mortgage tax deduction. Yes. And it's like, well, how do you accumulate wealth? I mean, uh, like. That's how we pass wealth on to the next generation. Yeah, and then, you know, everybody's not cut out to live in an apartment building or whatever. And, uh, you know, the American dream is supposed to be to open, own a home. This is a real mistake. Uh, the real estate industry would like you to believe that you're, God, you're really deprived if you don't own a home. But by doing this, just like telling everybody they should go to college, and they've vastly increased demand for homes and college, which and this more demand, the price gets outrageous. Now the mortgage uh, interest deduction goes mostly to wealthy people who itemize their deductions. It does nothing except make homes pricier and pricier. It's a very bad deal. Almost everybody criticizes this whole thing with this tax reform. Actually, there's something that's really reform. And first of all, the House was doing a better job of it than the Senate, but they ended up with the Senate version. Uh, so I'm sorry to get distracted here. <laughs> and it, so uh, it is, but the uh, idea of deducting, and Jean, you know all about this, because you and I studied this subject, and we lose a trillion dollars a year in tax revenue to tax deductions and credits. We would not have, we would have a balanced budget, we could be paying down our national debt, were it not for tax deductions, which are nothing but handouts by politicians to special interest groups. That's what they are. Okay, hope I use that. More hope, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the triplets of the challenges that we faced during the Civil Rights Movement were materialism, militarism, and racism. And could you talk about how that relates to your analysis this evening in your presentation? Uh, materialism, racism, and... Um, militarism. Yeah. Uh, militarism has been a thing I have fought and written, I mean, written about, talked about for years. Um, we talk about the federal government and um, the, the budget deficits and all that. 
nobody thinks twice, including Democrats, voting for huge increases. Now they want to spend $700 billion on the military, fiscal year 2018. That was approved by Democrats and almost all senators. No questions asked. So don't just knock the Republicans because the Democrats have no seats either. Militarism is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, they just, um, again, they, they plow through so much um, taxpayer money and, in this country, and they have, we spend way, uh, something like more than the rest of the world combined, something like that, and for the military. It's a terrible, militarism is terrible. I agree with that. Okay, racism, in my opinion, and I think we have to be fair, things have improved a lot. They really have. I mean, let's talk about facts, not, you know, wanting to raise, raise or replace or something. Because, and I know, I live in Chicago, which used to be one of the most racist of cities, and now it is not. I live in the north side of Chicago, and until the 1990s, blacks couldn't live there. Now they live all over. We have complete, we're the most integrated place on earth. This is all over the north side. I'm sorry, but racism is very much diminished. There's much more uh, people are uh, of rush, different races see each other. I'm getting just, do you have to do that now? Yeah. Charlie, I'm just, <laughs> this is uh, my part of my question. You're distracting. I can't even see the guy that... My question. Well, just uh, just keep, cool. keep going. All right. All right. So, the, no, no, so I do not think racism now. Of course, it was a terrible part of our history. And certainly, obviously, Martin Luther King's time, and some of us even fought for equal housing, um, fair housing, and stuff like that. So now we have fair housing in Chicago, no matter whether people want to watch it in the South Side and all that. And it's their choice now. And um, okay, militarism, uh, militarism, um, racism, and materialism. Material. I, I don't. I really have anything against materialism except that people go crazy again buying these new things just for the sake of buying. I mean, materialism under control is okay, but if you're going to spend every last penny on it, on buying things, it's, you know, that's out of control. Yeah. Okay, can I just have a quick follow-up to this? Yeah. It seems like the Cold War is over. That's an internationally established fact, but yet we're still spending Cold War era money on militarism, that seems part where we lost our way in the last 25 years. You're absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. And it's very upset. And year by year it goes up. They never come to a point where they stop. It never goes down. Yeah. And, and I've probably written more letters to Congress on this subject than any other subject. It's, it's been a concern for me. Wow. Okay. Um, here's the pest over here. All right. Come on. Me? Yeah, Charlie. All right, Margaret. Um, Ooh. The government collects money in the form of taxation and then in the what? collects what? money in the form of taxation and then distributes it to the population in the form of what you call entitlements. I use the word entitlement and I didn't mean the word entitlement. You, you, you call them entitlements. And I'm looking at them. No, sir, or that's something else. I wrote it down. I, you called it no, handouts. I, said benefits. I didn't say entitlements are social security and things that are guaranteed by law. Okay, handouts. I use your term, right, handout. They use the mic. Daycare subsidies and uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. are not entitlements. What you, use the mic, what you, Margaret. What do you call, okay, if you don't like the term entitlements, what term are you using? I use the term benefits. Okay, so the band? government outset it. Move on. So the government distributes it to the population equitably in the term of benefits. And I'm looking at the chart here, and it says they give a benefit of education, and they give a benefit of food to the hungry people, and they give housing to the homeless. Are you opposed to benefits like that? Health and health insurance for people who are sick. And you're opposed to this, you call it what? What's wrong with that? Isn't that what the government's supposed to do? If the government didn't do that, what would you call it? Uh, it was, um, I wouldn't find the part where I You want to pick up with a chart? Um, I don't know what. 
I'm looking for where I said what I said there. Uh, there's now a choice for all right. You want homeless people, Margaret? It was a, no, that that wasn't the word you used. Um, one. See. You're misquoting her again, Charlie. What? You're misquoting her again. <laughs> in any case, I can't find it, but what I said, I, I believe that the wording I used was, was uh, questionable benefits. I believe that's the word. Anyway, obviously, um, in fact, as a person who is in favor of having a balanced budget and taxes going for their real purpose, I am obviously for governments being there. That, that is, that's, um, but you need to have the money there. You can't be furthering it away so like people 20 years from now aren't being served by the government because they're paying back that huge debt. So I should leave not educate a generation? Well, who did I? I didn't say anything against education. Of course, well, you said sometimes you wonder if you're getting your money's worth, but um, Obviously, it's a function of government, yeah. You said the government's got to But I was about food, no, food, no. Food, if you're going to have food benefits, then you have to be limited. That, that, customer, that food stamp recipients can only uh, purchase, with, with food stamps, nutritious foods. They cannot purchase sugary foods. Now, reform groups have tried to get this changed, but the special interest groups, meaning the food companies are in there, Department of Agriculture preventing this. That's right. Do you want to control the diet of people? Well, you, you tell me. <laughs> you don't have to make things worse. You want to control the diet of the United States? Yes, <laughs> not control. Look, you, like you're throwing around uh, sugary foods and everything, you're controlling it the wrong way. Are you going to? I'll leave it at this, but... Okay, I, let's leave it at that. Okay, next the, question. Does the menu of this restaurant meet your approval? Have to get approval? <laughs> the point is how often you eat out in a restaurant. You know, you're not going to eat this way every day at home, I would okay. think. I think, Mark, would you have one over here? Oh, yes, I Well, I, I can't see why the American white male would back the Democratic agenda. Would I what? just can't see it. The why the American white male would back the Democratic agenda. Yeah, why? With immigration, with all these things that are... We lost our status in the past 10 years. And, uh, uh, I think both parties are very questionable. I myself am a Democrat. I mean, closer to that. But uh, Democrats have done a lot of terrible things. I mean, what about Hillary Clinton? She's running for president saying that families with incomes of up to $100,000 should have their kids' tuition free, free tuition at state colleges. Does that make any sense? Is there anything rational about that? Now, the Democrats are out with the handouts just like the Republicans, only Republicans it's the tax credits and tax, and, and tax deductions. And with the, well, the Democrats do that too. The Democrats is with the food stamps in the, uh, Heating assistance and that stuff. But they're finding out in Europe all these refugees uh, that walk uh, ten across as far as you can What's see. What's the question? The question is why are we? They want to bring in the Syrians. They want to bring eleven million uh, Mexicans, illegal uh, Mexicans here, yeah, and uh, uh, that, that that takes away jobs from the uh, uh, unskilled. Uh, 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 no, 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 no. You see, that, that this has been a uh, peeve with me uh, and with with oh unions God. too, talking about jobs being taken away by third world countries. Tell me, are we the only country? Or are Europe, is Europe the only country that's supposed to have people living at a good level? Every country, country in the world deserves to live at a good level, to get up to, to have indoor plumbing and all that stuff. We're not the only ones that matter. Let them live in Mexico. But they, the chain migration, each one of these is supposed to can bring five <coughs> of their uh, family. Chain migration. Yeah. These 11 million, 11 million, pretty soon it's going to be 50 million. If they give them amnesty, no. DACA also. No, no, Immig Mexican immigration has, as a matter of fact, I think it's net now. I think there are more going back than coming. But, but the point is that our economy would collapse if you got rid of them. They have helped a lot. They can end up being entrepreneurs and very productive, useful citizens. I, I agree we should be admitting more. No, I think it's enough. It's enough. But give the rights to the ones that are here now. 
11 million? Yes. And then leave it there, and then, and I don't believe in the wall that, but, but do some better, a better job of keeping out illegal immigrants in general. I agree, I agree. But now, this right. is, the, this is the, you know, these people have lives. Their businesses, their homes, their everything that depend on illegal Mexican immigrants. You can't just kick them out. We got what kind of a, it's going to be a mess. We got homeless people on State Street, Americans. We got to take care of these illegal people. Yeah, there's, a, there's more to it. That, I mean, a, an illegal person is working hard. Uh, you know, I mean, I think I have more respect for them than we people on the streets have a few problems, and that's got you know that's something they have we gotten got into the, themselves. Green cards for them to work okay, on the next farm. Question. But there's next a little question. million yeah, here. Okay, already. I think probably the discussions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I have several questions. Um, first of all, you spoke about the budgetary handout. <coughs> Excuse me. Louder, please. You spoke about the budgetary handouts. Handouts. Okay. Um, my question is this: Where are you getting your Where are your facts from? You speak of as if it's some large por portion of the budget. When, if you look at the chart in the vast majority of our budget is taken up by military expenditures. Okay, We're, we've spent we and our budget deficit, our, our our debt. We've got three unpaid for wars that we we haven't spent. We haven't paid for these wars. It's all coming out of uh, deficit spending. It's not. It has nothing to do with handouts to us. Okay, we're not getting handouts. In fact, we're getting things taken away from us all the time. We have protect. We have, the EPA is being stripped of protections. Um, you know, and if you, you know, oftentimes I'm, I'm looking at this chart, which is not a really good representation of the budgetary pie, because they group uh, human resources. The, the so-called entitlements, which are paid for by separate funding, which are not supposed to be part of the budget, um, you know, in with the actual budgetary things. They shouldn't, you know, we pay for our, our Social Security insurance. We pay for our Medicare insurance, okay? That's not a budgetary line item, okay? So my question is, you know, where are you getting your facts that, you know, Quote me some facts that are actual, a, actually accurate. I question your facts on this. You state you state that these are handouts and that it's it, you imply that it's a large portion of the deficit, where it really isn't. Food stamps is a minuscule part. Okay, just a brief reminder that we will have a chance to rebut the speaker after the question and answer period. Okay. And we appreciate your so, questions. You no, know, I want to. You no, know, no. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I know what you're referring to that pie chart, and I've seen it too. But uh, looking at current figures, and I have very good sources. If you're wondering where I get my figures, the Economist magazine is one of the best things I've ever read. The Week magazine, which I bring copies, and there are copies over there now, and the New York Times. Now, this is fairly unbiased. It's not. They don't have a uh, an extra line. They're like presenting, the, you know, what's really happening. And uh, as far as at this point, as I mentioned before, and I was, if you heard me, I'm very critical of military spending. I'm very upset with it. And I was telling you that it's in the fiscal year. I happen to follow budgets. Gene Hawker knows that I do. He and I studied this for six years. Uh, but it's coming out of the um, 700 billion, which is a lot, it's going up and up, is coming out of next year's budget. 2018 budget uh, for the military. Um, the um, the other things do add up. Food stamps. I believe the figure I saw was 70 billion a year. is substantially higher uh, over the last few years. Thank you. Um, and and again, the common sense is you know are they actually harming people with this extraordinary amount of you know this this kind of food help, especially if you're not limiting it to healthy foods. Um, but uh, as far as but the, one of the losses, remember I mentioned the loss to tax deductions and tax credits. There's another term for that, tax, tax expenditures, if you ever see that term. 
And that is one trillion dollars. And that I know for a fact because we were studying this for years. We've studied, we got these figures. And this is uh, and this is a huge amount. And this is what should be of concern, even more than what you spend maybe on food stamps with just throwing money away on these tax expenditures just so that the real estate industry or the um, what's the other one is thanks there's uh, there are other ones that um, you know that could just be or it, and as far as uh, food stamps you know who's getting rich on those is the food industry the food industry is down I'm telling you they're down there lobbying the Department of Agriculture to not have limits on how food stamps can be used. And that makes no sense. It's like your government purposely going out to Actually, harm your there health. Are li there are limits on what people can buy with these things. No, no, but not not by the kind. You know, you can't buy um, the liquor and stuff like that. But I, I mean, or soda pop. Or yeah, no pop, you can buy. No, you pop, cannot. But yeah, no, they they, they would try to get that change. Well, anyway, the point is, there's quite a bit, and I've seen it. I've seen people with food stamps buying this junk food, and. Um, the, uh, no, no, my, I, I stand by my facts completely. I'm a facts-based person. In fact, I get upset when other people don't stand by facts, and I get this. It's ever written. I have notebooks full of notes, and then when I prepare this presentation, it's based on those notes from these good sources. Okay. Yeah. Who are you? And what's your... Wait, wait, so, no, no, you've already... The guy can... Right here is one. He hasn't had a question yet. I understand that you feel that there are many things wrong, but I don't understand from your presentation what you feel needs to change. And so I would invite you to give me two definite proposals for what needs to change and characterize them in terms of whether they represent greater choice or a reduction of choice. Can you repeat it? I can think of two things that could be changed, but I don't know what you mean, greater choice or less choice. You mean, what would my choices be? What? Your speech was about choice. Right. Freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. So if there's going to be a change, would it be aligned with a increase in freedom of choice or a decrease or a reduction? Oh, 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 I see, oh, I see. No, we, I, 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 we can't decrease choice. No, I, I there's the the cats out of the bag or so to speak. I think after the 1960s and everything was thrown out, we, we sort of were stuck with the choices. But so I, I guess the way to go is, is like I say, to uh, urge people to make the right choices, reasonable, rational choices. But you can't eliminate choice, no. No, I wouldn't say that. Over here, Margaret. Okay. Oh. <coughs> How uh, would you advise Mr. Trump? How would you advise Mr. Trump? Could you repeat the question, please? He's asking how would, he, how would Margaret advise Mr. Trump, and what advice would Margaret give to Mr. Trump? Uh, resign. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty bad. Obviously, everything, I mean, nothing he does, most of what he does is wrong, so do the opposite of what he's doing. You're, you know, <coughs> just hopeless. All right. Uh, excuse me, I, I think over here is next. Because you've already... Yes. No, no, you didn't have a question. Are, are you with a cap? Are you... I asked you? the question earlier. But, oh, you did. But, I'm sorry. But, well, anyway, you, I'll do a follow-up real quick to my... Uh, but at the end of time, like, I'm going to own a house, or I actually already own a house. I don't consider myself wealthy. If you lived only, like, in an apartment or whatever, you're just going to have a stack of rent receipts when you're done. And then I could apply for a reverse mortgage. And see, so I don't have to worry about, you know, only living on Social Security even. See, that will help me. So I don't understand you're against this uh, well, mortgage reduction. I don't think it's wise to think of your... Uh, which are you going to become? <laughs> no, what, do you have a stack of rent receipts or do you have a, a, a home? Which, which is it? What? what? What do you have? Do you have a stack of rent receipts or do you own a home? No, I have a home apartment <coughs> and a, a large bank account. And in my family, we've never earned much money. Never. Low income people with a big bank account. Yeah, that's possible. Um, I can be finished. Um, 
as far as but as far as your financial situation, I mean it. You, you can, it, but you don't have to own a house or property to build up a bank account. I mean, there's such a thing as keeping a budget, and you're gonna save so much money every month. They used to have a saying: uh, "Pay yourself when you get your paycheck. Pay yourself first. So, yeah, I told him. Yeah. I guess your next question. Franklin Delano Roosevelt talked about uh, the second part of the New Deal, which was never enacted, but it is on record. In fact, there's a great account of him proposing it in the movie Capitalism, A Love Story. Uh, he talked about a job, house, health care, human services, uh, safe retirement, communities that work for everyone, and overall uh, peace and uh, stability. In, it seems, it seems like uh, during Roosevelt's era where he proposed the second chapter of the New Deal, but it was never enacted, uh, we had just defeated fascism and we kind of became the monster that we had just defeated in our own militarism uh, to defeat the monster. So could you talk about that fork in the road during the New Deal era where there actually was a second chapter that was never put into play? And that's part of the, also the reason why we kind of lost our way. I kind of disagree with with that. I mean, I know. I mean, I I believe what you're saying, but I don't think. I think what happened after, as I understand, it, after World War II, was they felt the the population had been deprived, and they were just going to give them everything to make up for it. There's since been the depression. Then there had been the World War II and rationing and sacrifice. So now the American people, but not by way of the government, by the way, that was when industry was being kind to workers. And um, and that's when uh, industry started uh, giving out the medical benefits and uh, wages were going up and up and up. And there was much less inequality uh, between, you know, classes. So uh, that was kind of a, a honeymoon period, I would say. Uh, people were saving money, even though mothers were staying home in that, and uh, it was a much better time, except for one thing, and that was segregation. But that started, you know, as we know, eased up into the, um, starting with civil rights and all of that, by this time, things are pretty good. Okay. Uh, I don't know who I can see it. Not, no. Who's, Charlie, what you, yeah, Margaret, uh, All right. am I correct that you kind of seem to think that poor people obviously are poor because they made poor decisions? Yes, that's right. And so all property, is poverty of choice. There's no such thing as poverty of circumstance. Rarely, rarely. Rarely? Someone is wow. handicapped or something like that. Yeah, that's not their, their they may be poor. Are you no part of their, their pro, no fault of their own. But I know plenty of people, all my life I've known these lackadaisical, don't get their act together, people with perfectly normal abilities. She, she hasn't had a question, the other gal has. And then we'll get you next. You mentioned about the We'll get you next. You mentioned, just in, in, in earlier, you mentioned about the um, the fact that Chicago is egalitarian and non-racist. And um, now you're mentioning about, uh, now there's this um, new topic about, uh, there is no, well it's not, there is no, um, the, the, okay, um, Basically, I think that Chicago is still very racist. I disagree with you on that. The whole South Side is all black. The educational opportunities are not what they are in some of the North Side. So there is a difference in opportunity. Plus, if, if you're terrorized going to school and you're getting mowed down on the street, you're not going to be a good performer in school. So that does limit your ed educational opportunities because you can't function. And, and I don't see how you can just skip that over. 
if you look at a microcosm, and that's my question, is how can you, how can you skip the, when you do your analysis, how can you just completely dismiss the inequities in the, in the, in the um, available resources? Uh, because uh, black folks can live in, are not forced to live on the south side as they used to be, or the west side. This is a choice. As a matter of fact, many blacks have voted with their feet. They have left the south side and west side because they know it's no darn good. This isn't the problem of race this, or racism. This is uh, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of history. Unfortunately, can I finish this answer? Uh, it's, it's unfortunate that history is such that we had a very segregated city. It's very embarrassing. It's very bad. But this has changed. Now, you have to give credit to when things improve. You can't go back to the bad, uh, bad history. And the, the fact is that uh, the black folks are living the, leaving the South Side and the West Side for this very reason. And the ones that are still there, all right, I'm not going to finish that sentence. I, there are no black people here to answer. Here's one. Oh, thank you. Okay. Why do you want to touch base on, like, I know you talked about equal opportunity. Can you speak louder, please? I know you talked about equal opportunity for all people, including blacks and whites and Hispanics, but I must say, as a person of the of the South Side, you live on the South Side. You see, you, you see um, 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 people being forced out because due to high property tax, most people can't afford to live on the North Side, so they have no choice but to go to areas such go to areas that has um, has low property value. And once they do settle there, they're being forced out due to the fact that they want to build new roads, and then you have to deal with the schools in these south side communities being closed also so it's like it's it it hurts in the sense of way that you're saying that everyone has the same opportunity when they don't including not just black people hispanic people too That's right their school there um there are schools in their neighborhoods that are being closed right. and not being <coughs> fully developed being fully funded then you have them opening up charter schools in these neighborhoods that they know these kids are not going to be able to be able to um Place and be able to succeed in. So it's it's a it's a undeveloped uh, opportunity. Then you have it where some parents can send their kids to a school on the north side, but in, in a such in a, a sense of a way they don't feel welcome because they know they're out of place. So it's many um, contributions that goes into like being a south sider and being yeah. a. I know you're kind of you're young. You're very young looking. But do you? I don't know if you're aware that there used to be busing. And it yes. used to be an attempt to actually integrate blacks into I other know. areas. My mother grew up in the Robert Taylor projects. I'm under I understand that development. But you also have to look at when Kennedy Kennedy went to Harlem. This is around the time he was running for president. I'm very aware of history and how it works. And Kennedy went to Harlem. He saw all these black people in this in this neighborhood that was slum. He said, "Let's not give them welfare. Let's not give them food stamps. Let's not give them the, let's give them jobs and opportunities to better themselves." But when you look at the South Side, I'll view it as me being John F. Kennedy, viewing it as we need to give them something. We don't. The solution for us is not moving to the north side. The solution is putting resources and opportunities in that community. That's how I look at it. Well, if this is the way. Black I'm sorry folks, to. Wait a minute. If, if this is the way black folks feel. Then let them pull themselves into organizations and do it. I mean, I'm all behind you. If you can do it, then do it. But it's it's not. What's wrong is blaming the rest of society. I'm not saying you are, but. Mm -hmm. Some people are sort of blaming the rest. That's what I think is unfair. Because as I said, as I've said about the North Side, it's the most integrated place on Earth, probably. I mean, we have people from everywhere, and everybody is accepted, and every restaurant and everything. So it's not fair to say that racism is being pushed down somebody's throat. There is not racism in this part. I mean, it's a, a, a historical act. What you're talking about is a, an unfortunate historical thing that people. They are still remaining in these segregated places, and I don't even know why. But if you feel that you really want to make something of it, then pull yourselves together and do it. Yeah, but get, get your charter schools and get yourself better schools in there, and uh, and get your PTAs going and, and do this stuff. If that, if you really want to have a South Side, I mean, I personally, if I were like, I wouldn't. You know, I mean, I would want, I would either go to the North Side or I go to Indiana. You know, cheaper in Indiana. Indiana has very. If you look at the history of the South Side, you look at the Black Panthers. They they started resources for 
black African American people. If you look at the history of how we, how the South Side came about, you could never say, "Oh, I'm going to move to, I'm going to move up north just to give, uh, just to get a better life." When you look at history, people, black people didn't move up north to escape, to escape segregation. They wanted a change in in the South, and that's how I feel when when, it, when I hear you say that about the South Side because I'm from the South Side and I know my history of the South Side. It's not just, "Oh, we're going to pop out and move up north." Because I've been segregated up north. I've been segregated, been 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 looked upon badly being up north. But it doesn't stop me from coming up here every single day. Yeah, but the people that I know, black folks on the north side, believe in integration, and I believe in it. And I don't believe there should be solidly black or white areas in the city. And that there are, I think, it's a mistake. And I think, if anything, you should be fighting that. What's your solution for that? What's your solution to make yeah. the I think maybe we probably are taking up too much time. No, sorry. We can okay, talk later. All right, okay. Yeah. You will have a chance to rebut. Thank you. And, 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 and like I said, we'll, we'll give you plenty of chance to rebut. Let's, uh, who else has got questions for Margaret? All right, Jean hasn't had one yet. Uh, Margaret, uh, can you conceive of a situation where people have two bad choices? And what do they do, rather than good choices? Two bad choices. Well, they always say, like, when you're voting, you still have two evils. Um, probably, at least. That would be evil, one, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, you've got two bad choices. Uh, well, you know what you do, Gene. You make lists, you know. What are the pluses for this choice, and what are the pluses for that choice? Whichever one has the most pluses is the one you choose, I guess. I know, we've all been in situations where there's like, it's damn if you do and damn if you don't. I know. Thank you. Uh, set. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, uh, who, who are you and what's your background? Are you a legislator or something? Uh, oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I'm a, I'm a former League of Women Voters member. I was very, very involved. We were studying <laughs> issues. The League never took positions without studying them in detail. So like we kind of got in this habit of, of getting background information before we spout it off. Uh, and um, other than that, I've been home with my um, handicapped son and daughter for some years. And um, that's about, I have a bachelor's degree in political science, <laughs> whatever else. I worked for 13 years. And, um, uh, my last job was with the city of Chicago. I was a representative for an urban, an urban renewal relocation representative. I worked in where they were tearing down buildings. And uh, I've been in a lot of organizations. Uh, I'm an activist. I'm with the Sierra Club right now. Environmentalism. I've worked on uh, affordable housing issues. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, could you tell us? Uh, do you have a suggestion of what might be done about the the gap uh, inequality in about this country? About the what? The inequality gap between the rich and the poor in the United States. It's the worst it's been in a hundred years. Do you have a suggestion of what people could do to begin to solve that problem? Um, first of all, well, obviously taxes. Um, um, taxes, taxes are a complicated problem. But I'll tell you one very obvious thing that would level the playing field. The, the Republicans don't like the estate tax. Um, and they want to abolish it, but now they're going to keep it for six years, but lowering it so it doesn't apply to an estate of less than $11 million. Now, rather than having this sort of, not landed gentry, but you know what I mean, if people are, are inheriting these huge amounts, you know it's going to keep us more split apart. And uh, the country needs this money. And it would be far fairer to tax the estates, it, it's a, it's a, um, what do you call it? Harm, not harmless. It's um, 
nobody was ever harmed by, by paying the state tax, especially in the amounts. Um, so that would be an equalizer. Um, now, there are a lot of things that are done to lower income people, like for example, people like in the service industries that are required to have change their schedule every week. It's a terrible hardship. I mean, it's hard for them. How are they supposed to hold a second job? I mean, if you want to increase their incomes, that would make it more equal. Give them a chance to do it. Um, don't make housing so expensive. Look at the rents now in Chicago are $1,000. Have, this is the big one. Your big household expense is housing. Have a Section 8 program that works. And I know for a fact it doesn't. Because I, we had a, a tenant from Section 8. It's a very, very bad bureaucracy that runs it. They hold on to their money. It's been in all the, the newspapers. Try to get as many people, renters, that a, everyone that's paying more than 30% of their income for rent should be in subsidized housing. You should have a Section 8 program that's working, that's funded adequately, which has never been funded adequately. And then Chicago Housing Authority has been holding on to the money they have rather than giving out vouchers. And they have loads of people on their waiting list. So I'll, that is the big equal, equalizer, I think. Because once you have your housing costs under control, you don't have to worry. I mean, the rest of the stuff you can easily budget. Your food, your utility. I guess the only thing is, what, what would you do in a city like Chicago where there's not enough jobs for the people that are living here? The factories have been shut down and moved overseas. We need a couple hundred thousand jobs that aren't here anymore. They used to be here. Now these people are unemployed because uh, I, I hate to see people leave Chicago, but to be honest, you really have to vote with your feet. I mean, there are plenty of jobs in other places. Now, I don't like Texas, and I wouldn't want to live there, but they do have jobs. You go out to, um, where is it, um, Las Vegas, is, I think I had heard they have a lot of jobs. You're, only, you're really almost going to have to get out and, up, you know, and, and get to a place where they have the jobs. That's really the solution. Well, okay. I hear the undertone of what you're saying is possibly, I'm not assuming this, I'm just asking right now, is that we need to all get involved in organizing. Yes, sir. Because you know what's happened? If anyone here has read well, Bowling Alone, they're pointing out what's happened in our society is people have gotten away from civic involvement. It's all this. What? Saul Alinsky is a great Chicago. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Grassroots, face to face, not looking at a cell phone all day long. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No. And that just have now all these organizations, including the League of Women Voters, all they really want you to do is not be involved, but they want you to hand over money. All they yeah. want is money. And I'm gonna say if the Sierra Club is about the only group I know of that's a grassroots organization where you can get in there and work on an issue. But you're absolutely right. We have a lack of civic involvement. Sierra Club, the biggest bureaucracy in the East Coast. Yeah, I can't hear you. The Sierra Club is the biggest bureaucracy, the oldest bureaucracy in the eco movement. What are you talking about? Who would criticize the Sierra Club? It's a big. It is. It's a. All right. Mayor, that's not my question. I know about this. Damn the Greenpeace. What? Them and Greenpeace, a bureaucracy. I've been to Sierra Club. They got a big, big office downtown. You think they got that for nothing? Come on. Well, they have. It's a big. They have what? It's true, but they do That's do things. They question. do things, and I've been there and for, done them. Yeah, I've been there. So Go I know there, for yeah. a fact they do things. The other it's group. The only game in town. The other ego groups meet wherever they can get a free room. What, what's that? The what? The other eco groups meet where they can get a free room. Oh, well. But I bet you they're not but as that's influential. Not my question. Your, your idea is that, oh, you just make a budget, live frugally, 
And life is like like easy. For yes, it is, Tom. And you know, I don't know that if, because I've done What happens if the kid wants to go to school? A guy like me says, "Hey, I'd like to go to school," and I guess the dad will say, "Well, I didn't budget for that." And well, there's no handouts. We're not taking any handouts. There's no handouts because they were disallowed a few years ago, right? So what do I do? Go on educators? That's the perfect oh, world you prefer? Oh, okay. Charles, if you want an answer, I know from personal experience, from living on a moderate income all my life, that it is possible. Okay? That's anecdotal information. Charlie, no, it's not. If you look at something called Dave Ramsey and the people he talks to, about financial counseling that's one of the biggest financial planning movements in the country amongst the Christian church. He has done more good and had a profitable company at the same time by teaching people basic budgeting skills. Good. And that, in that way she is absolutely right. It's just, it's just, it's called proper money management. Yeah, it's called money management. Life isn't made that way. We understand there's circumstances that happen. Yeah, but what if you get unemployed? What if you get laid off? What it's you happened to my husband, what but it's happened to Dave twice. What happens if you get an on the Charlie, job injury? Dave has what been laid off cancer? from factories twice. What if your no, child three times. Three times. Come on. Yeah. There is. There are yeah. circumstances that, that sometimes you need to help. Think life is a good What's that? Cutter? There are circumstances sometimes you need to help. I point to my friend Allie who had the medical disease called scleroderma towards the end of her life. Uh, she was able to live maybe another five years or more because of the because of the uh, aid from the government that she was able to get with the help of her medical bills and everything else. Um, yeah, but uh, that's a special service. That, that, I mean, I'm, I'm talking saying. about regular able-bodied people. Right, yeah, yeah. right. That I agree with. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Uh, how many want to think it's time to go to rebuttals now? All right, Margaret, let's thank Miss right. Margaret again tonight. Margaret, appreciate your uh, speech and appreciate your views. Uh, let's get up here. We'll go with maybe six minutes each tonight because of the uh, extended time we have. How about one more round for, for, uh, for Margaret? All right. Six. Well, hey. All right. Adjust your microphone accordingly. Hey. All right. hey. You don't have to take the full six minutes. Six minutes, my Thank goodness. Thank you, my darling. Wow. Ho, 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 Charlie. And you'll have more six minutes to spot off much of nothing like you normally do. <laughs> All right, let's go. I'm working on my budget. <laughs> We're time budgeting now, Charlie. You already exceeded your budget a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you, the speaker. Uh, why isn't the United States a democracy yet? Could have been the underlying theme of a lot of speakers this year, including this evening's presentation by Margaret. Uh, why isn't the United States a uh, democracy yet? Well, uh, we talked about one of the reasons why we're not a democracy. A democracy after it defeats a uh, military uh, fascist regime in World War II doesn't say let's become a big military regime then after that victory. What a democracy says is let's invest it in education, in human services, in health care, in job training, in infrastructure, in fair and free elections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a fork in the road there in 1945 where a lot of people were aware that there was a second chapter of the New Deal to negotiate, to thoroughly explain to the American people so you could use the bully pulpit to get the masses out there on the streets, putting pressure on their local, state, and federal legislators to say, we haven't finished the job yet. We haven't won the peace. We won the war. We didn't win the peace, and that's very important uh, that we all as Americans constantly remind each other, especially in Christmas time, where it's about peace on earth, goodwill towards all, is that you can't win a war. Wars are not winnable. Uh, wars end. The killing ends. 
uh, one side surrenders to another. It's not like a game where it's won or lost, okay? Uh, wars are acts of companies, organizations, profiteers, governments. When madness is normalized and the failed leadership flunks out into full-scale de-evolution, one, one step shy of extinction. And World War II, when World War II was over, the U.S. Empire's goal was not to begin policy in order to uh, bring about more disarmament, more diplomacy, and more partnerships of global betterment. Okay, uh, we're told this by Time Magazine and Life Magazine and CNN. Uh, after last year's election, I'm sure you all can say that those three sources are not the most reliable sources in retrospect to get your information of what's really going on in the world. Uh, no disrespect for the people who might have family members who are working for those sources or are used to work for those sources. But it's a fact, corporate media is BS. Um, with the exception of the Marshall Plan, we didn't win the peace. And it's an honest mistake. But it's a mistake that I think we could learn at the end of the Cold War. Let's have a Marshall Plan for saying that, okay, it, the fork in the road in 1945, we didn't exactly go as far as we could have at the end of the Cold War. Let's do that. We're sort of at a new weird era where there isn't a Bush and there isn't a Clinton, either as head of state, vice president, or secretary of state for the first time in 35 years, where it's not necessarily as great as opportunity as I would have liked at the end of the Cold War in the mid-90s or at the end of World War II in 1945. But you can see people aren't falling into the left-right uh, paradigm trap of how to view public policy and civics anymore. People are starting to understand that we're independent, we can uh, organize, we can mobilize, and we can say uh, there's a third independent option that isn't left or right, uh, it's going up. So we're not going left or right sometimes when we find out about these solutions, we're going up. It's important to educate about peace. Dennis Kucinich <coughs> once suggested that we have an institute of peace so that we have just as much uh, talk and uh, uh, emphasis and importance placed in our educational and social and cultural and legislative uh, discussions about peace as we do about military. And I think it's a great idea that bears repeating. Uh, we should have an institute of peace. If we are a civil nation, a nation that uh, depends on our ideas and not on our bombs and our bullets and our missiles, then we should have an institute of peace. And I encourage you all not to Google it, but to duck, duck, go it. Don't Google anything anymore. Duck, duck, go. Institute of Peace, Dennis Kucinich. Uh, it's a great, great uh, source of information at the holiday time. Um, Peace is not won. Peace is lived. It's not a euphoric victory or a devastating defeat. Uh, genuine peace is more like a tie. It isn't one nation at the very top of the ladder, strong and proud, and another one at the bottom, helpless and humiliated. Uh, peace is a big circle of all of us equally placed apart from each other, uh, equally listening to and respecting each other's uh, voices. Um, I hope that we all take to heart on this holiday season that if we've become the military monster that we fought so hard and our grandparents, both of my grandparents fathers happened to serve during World War II against, uh, it's important that we don't become the monster in order to defeat the monster. Even when we're told by corporate media every day that everything's fine because the mall's still open, uh, we might in fact be that big as perceived by the rest of 95% of planet Earth, that big military monster that we should humble ourselves and we can start by voting people out and also organizing simultaneously for peace. Thank you, Mark. Right. Next, please, Jane. Thank you, Jonathan. Unfortunately, I was thinking of my rebuttal rather than what you said, but you gave us a workshop on peace. Thank you very much. I would add to that the Vietnam series. I watched it four times so far. I keep learning. Uh, 
But anyway, with Margaret, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I am one of the probably two or three people here who read your, both your books. I would certainly recommend them. Uh, I disagree with Margaret on some points, that's for sure. Uh, I want to make one or two points. One, Pogo. Uh, Pogo said something like, we have met the enemy and he is us. We all make bad decisions. I'm not going to go in here and tell you all the bad decisions I made, but rather I want to say that I am a person of privilege. Uh, I live in an integrated place. And yes, if you're old and black, you can move to Hollywood House. I love it. Uh, we got plenty of black people, we got plenty of white people, we got plenty of uh, transgendered people. I, I think we got a couple anyway, I can't tell one from another. But anyway, certainly Hollywood House, yes, there are places of integration, but often I go to state and uh, state and uh, 95th Street. And let me tell you, we got a segregated city. I go down there, I see, what, a hundred people something, and there are about one or two Caucasian people. But anyway, I am a person of privilege. I know a lot of women who have PhDs who don't have nearly as much money as I've got. Now, why is that? Well, I'm a white male the oldest in my family of three. I came uh, to uh, adulthood when it was easy to go to school. I had a master's degree. Sure, it wasn't Harvard, but here's how much debt I have. I am glad I'm not young. Also, we ought to, I should close by saying we should, and I'm not criticizing Andy, I can't do a better job, but we got a system here. We're supposed to give a presentation that was given. There's a question period, not a debate period, in which you're supposed to ask a brief question and not a, a soliloquy ending at, what do you think of this? And the third thing you're supposed to do is come up here and rebut the speaker. If you don't agree with Margaret, uh, don't debate, Bob, sometimes we need to repeat these rules again and again and again and again. I've been here for a couple years, so it kind of sinks in on me the way you're supposed to do it. But uh, that would help if we uh, did that. But uh, I agree, I would say I respectfully disagree with, with Margaret about race. Race is horrible. We've ruined this country, and why? We all came from Africa. What the hell is this? Thank you. Our next rebutter, please. Who's next? You mean to tell me we got an open mic and no rebutters? Oh, I'll get up there. Come on. I'll get up there. All right, please. You've got six minutes to uh, go ahead and. Uh, All right. Oh, I'm going to keep it very short. All right. Hi. I'm Aaron. I'm new to this, so I apologize if I've made some protocol errors. Don't worry about it. Um, We'd love to hear you speak. There's a couple of assumptions that were made by our speaker this evening, and a lot of assumptions, and a lot, and very little confirmed factual data, okay? There were allusions towards uh, two income families and children being left in child care. My question is this, I'm gonna basically do my rebuttal through questions of thought. What ha how come we have to have to have two income families? What has been going on in our society um, you know, we talk about these more so-called idyllic times uh, back in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. 
Well, union membership was at 35 percent of our country at that time. What is what has the effect of the war on unionism had on our families? And how many families now have to be two incomes just to make our rents or our mortgage payments? So I'll say that. The assumption was also that it was very heteronormative. Um, assuming that there are, you know, everybody's going to have children and it's going to be a, a mom and a dad. What happened to same sex couples? Um, lastly, is as the rebuttal person before me said, the concept of privilege. And it's not just male privilege, it's white privilege, it's heterosexual privilege, it's all forms of privilege, it's uh, middle class privilege, it's privilege of location, privilege of education. A lot of assumptions were made, not enough facts were offered, and that's where I'll leave it tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, our next rebutter, please. <laughs> First of all, in regard to some of the statements that Margaret made, I don't think the answer to our job problems in Chicago is voting with your feet and leaving town. I'm sorry. I think instead that we should do our best to create as many jobs here as possible. And I don't think that the answer to some of what she said is that everybody who collects a welfare check is, is, is automatically lazy or getting a handout. That sounds like the sort of bullshit that conservatives have been, de have been doling out since I was a teenager, and, and that was like 50 years ago. Um, with regard to some of the comments that were also made about how the, the United States took the wrong road after World War II, I disagree with that. I disagree for two reasons. First, the need for a continuing military uh, buildup after the war was something that Stalin forced on us, plain and simple. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the United States had the greatest peacetime expansion after the Second World War, with, <clears throat> with jobs for practically everybody. Now, it's true that some people were excluded from this, uh, such as African Americans, and that was something that was finally touched on. Uh, and finally, Charlie was going around saying earlier that well, people get their news from commie sources. I call that mighty brave talk from someone who came to this meeting wearing a red shirt. Thank you. Oh, oh. Oh. It's Christmas. All right. Come on. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, God, God. Oh, oh, Andy, you got an open mic. Go ahead and get up there. Put the mic. Go ahead. Why do you hate uh, uh, Christmas Day? <laughs> All right. Please, speak your piece. Hello, everyone. Uh, you know me as a speaker before this crowd of right. some repute. Uh, once in a while, I drop in and uh, enjoy the festivities as an audience member. The, the warnings that happened in the uh, announcement period before the speech took me aback that you're actually so misbehaved I have grown so misbehaved, you are at risk of being kicked out of another venue. <laughs> so, all the evidence is there before me, and I have to say, you're going to lose it. You're going to have to go begging head in hand for another venue because you're going to get yourselves kicked out of this place. Oh. And it will be deserved. Mm. <laughs> when I read the blurb on the website today and decided, okay, I'll come and give this one a try. I had thought that maybe I was going to hear a speech something about how choice functions as a crucible for decision making and how that decision making plays out, especially with so many poor choices being made in the world and in the United States and in Chicago and in Illinois. I didn't get anything close to that from our speaker. Several of you said, well, uh, Margaret, on your analysis, well, I didn't see or hear any analysis. I heard a series of contentions, a couple of facts without any actual source behind them. 
and just a sort of rambling, yes, it just ought to be, you know, and everything's going to hell, and it was just like cranky old man talk. I'm a cranky old man. So I, I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I could do a better analysis sitting in my chair eating dinner. So let me offer that at least three different types of choice seem to be at issue for us these days. We have political choices, how we vote, who we vote for, what our policies are, what our prescriptions are. We have consumer choices, especially in this era of Christmas shopping. We all know that we're de dealing with a huge plethora of choice available to us. We can buy so many things that are being um, offered to us as our heart's desires, but of course are really just manufactured desire. And then the third category I would offer would be behavioral choice. So our speaker did comment, at least on behavioral choice, chalked it up to the libertinism of the 1960s and said, what you gonna do? And then she commented on um, consumer choice, chalked it up to the behavior of the corporations and said, what you gonna do? And then when I asked for a policy prescription in my question, during the question and answer session, asked her whether it would actually be an increase or a decrease in change, she couldn't give me a single policy prescription or some change, it was more what you gonna do. So I would submit that she has a few better choices to make. Okay. All, right. All right, Charlie, get up there. All right, you insist on this. Yeah, we want I you wore to... this decorative shirt for you. <laughs> it, 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 it's appropriate for all the propaganda you spent out, Charlie. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you, Margaret. Very nice. We got, got a lot here to talk about here tonight. I'm going to get to some, we got a lot of time, but, yeah, but I'm going to get rid have. of some of the, the boring stuff right now. I just, as a matter of fact, posted something to the labor community today regarding pensions. Um, most people, only 24% of the people that are retiring uh, today have a, what is called a defined pension provided by their employer or their union, their organized labor union. Uh, the employers stopped doing this about three decades ago and we're looking at the current generation because this is the first generation to retire under the, when the system changed that you were talking about. Um, as it turns out, uh, I believe, I'm trying to search my mind, virtually nobody, 50% or less, have any sort of retirement savings, and those that do, it amounts to only $25,000. So, this system isn't working. People are relying upon Social Security, which will entitle you to $14,000 a year. Uh, you're not going to get any sort of retirement out of $25,000 um, annuity. Um, the, the life expectancy is to 79 years. So you're talking about 13 years or so that you're going to need finances for. Uh, though I have heard the figure that many people only receive a check, uh, a monthly check for 18 months. So, and I've been talking about this on many occasions here, that you work your entire life to make some guy rich. And then when you reach a certain age, he says, thank you, uh, I'll see you around sometime. But the gist of the article, it's in the Washington Post, to come to the Facebook page or contact me by email and it's a current thing a very interesting article in the Washington Post that people are seeking these Walmart type uh, positions or crossing guard positions and with no real return I actually have someone who attends a college and I know is going through the situation they work like three days a week 
Uh, but anyhow, let's get back to Margaret, because we don't want to leave her forgotten here. Uh, there's a, such a thing as personal and private finance, and then there's the public finance. Another way to think of it is personal or private wealth, and then there's public wealth. And where did these come together, and where do they differ? Um, I totally disagree with you entirely that uh, poverty is a matter of, of choice. That that's an absurdity in and of itself. It's it's not a correct thing. No one chooses poverty. Uh, there's nothing. Believe me, I I even times in my life when I was poor that this is not something one chooses. Uh, there's poverty of circumstance, and that's what really governs it. We, somebody was talking here about jobs and things. Andy was, you know. Uh, the one of the things there, now all you got to do there, we got a simple little situation here, is we simply make a budget, you know, and then, uh, you know, everything's going to be, you know, personal finances will, will work out in that fashion. Um, well, no, there's a thing, and anything that you do in this regard is called an unforeseen circumstances. There are variables that uh, will come in and the best laid plans of mice and men will dissipate. Uh, so you simply don't make a budget and, and then be frugal and, life, and, and then you achieve tranquility. Let me give you an example. You were giving me an anecdotal example. One party of direct experience that I had, a couple ran a restaurant much like this one here. Uh, the husband uh, had a stroke and shortly afterwards the spouse, his spouse, the woman was diagnosed with cancer. There went their planning. That's what I mean. We try to the one thing is you try in these situations, as you call it, you, you reduce anxiety uh, as, as much possible. And, and you, that's why you call it, we live in a society. And that's what we expect a society to do. We expect those in charge of governing to structure society in such a way to reduce the circumstances that uh, result in that thing. Now, here's another example. I, I'm going to help you guys out, you know, and to understand this. Now, we can have Santa Claus, and he's got a workshop, and he makes toys, and he, he gives these out, dispenses these around the world to every girl and boy. In my world, in Margaret's world, mom and dad do it. Now, I don't know which world you want, but I think, you know, there's uncertainties regarding this every man for himself kind of concept here. I think we are a pretty good society that we can take care of one another's circumstances. Um, I'm not too concerned about this, this, uh, that, that's the worst thing, you know, that, that I heard a little bit earlier, and there wasn't the one you got to, but they, they come up with this all deficit thing, and what is the first thing you got to do? Now, you didn't want to use the term, oh, because we have a deficit, there will, tomorrow, there will, from now on, there will be, I guess you call it, you finally, there will no longer be any benefits. And that's what I think the real issue on this tax plan is is that a few years from now, guess what? The, all these benefits, that little pie chart there, where the 42% is, there's not going to be any money for that because we have a deficit. Now, we created the deficit through our own choice and the plan we enacted in December of 2017, but now we have to deal with them. We're responsible legislators, and we can't have a deficit, right? The deficits come by what? They come by choice. They come by choice. There are choices that are made. Like she was saying, there, there's choices that are made. So along the line, but um, I think we can care for one another. Um, and, and to say that, well, we just take a course or something, you know? I kept thinking, if I want to go to college, you know, 
I, you know, this is this. Most families are two weeks away from what bankruptcy. Yep. Uh, uh, there are circumstances where companies shut down, uh, illnesses, accidents happen to people. Uh, just a myriad of circumstances uh, for which there is no the safety net is perhaps the government. You know, if 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 it comes out because there's nobody else out there. And um, we've got to see that there's structures in place. You know, uh, private charities aren't, aren't going to be able to do it all, uh, or the churches and things like that. But anyhow, thanks a lot. You gave us a lot to talk about. And uh, have a nice holiday here. Okay. I think it's a nice show. Well, let's tell us. He hasn't got one cool like me. All right, all right. <laughs> Good evening and Merry Christmas to one and all. All holidays matter. Uh, is it a holiday or a holy day? Holy day. Uh, it's a holy day because it's spiritual. It's holiday because of commercialism. Right. Santa Claus is the commercial element, but Saint Nicholas is the spiritual element. Santa Claus just didn't pop out of the sky. And both are factor There was seven. Saint Nicholas. Both are factor of seven, you know. And uh, uh, both make money. Yeah. It was taken in here like, uh, how can we tell the male from the females in trans? <coughs> and uh, another good statement here was, peace is worn in not, in not it, peace is not worn but lived. That's beautiful. In Pogo also, uh, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. Pogo, that's quite a statement too. And somebody said here, uh, love your neighbor and yourself. How does that, what does that mean? I am the little me, but we yeah, is the I big know. me. You're supposed to make, love your neighbor as yourself, like the big self. I am the little me, but we is the big me. Well, I know. Uh, several years back, on uh, Christmas Eve, they had the, what they had? About queer sex. That was really kind of strange. What actually should we, uh, we doing today? I think we should... Uh, Think about the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. What, everybody, you don't have any keynote speaker, just everybody shares, what was the greatest thing about the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? I must have seen that thing about a half a dozen times. And each one must have seen it at least once. What was the greatest thing in, the, in there? Uh, like uh, Uncle Billy, the Uncle Bird, he said, is happy. Which one? The one in the middle. <laughs> the one in the middle. Okay, that, uh, I just want to leave you this here. I am the little me, but we is the big me. Hi everybody, I just wanted to come up here and show gratitude and thankfulness to Margaret. Thank you for coming out, thank you for sharing your opinions, thank you for helping me to understand that there are people out there who do not see things the way that I see things because I see things a little bit more differently because I come from a different background. And I'm always open to learning new ways of thinking and ideas of other people. So I just want to thank you for that. But I just wanted to get up here and um, tackle the first topic, which was um, poverty is a choice. Uh, just to let you know, sadly, that is not a choice. I, even though I grew up in a household with two working class parents, um, they made a, they made enough money to not qualify for government assistance, assistance, but they did not make enough money to be able to support two children and be able to put food on the table because they didn't qualify for those things. And also save up for our college tuitions on the side of them working a day-to-day -day job. Um, I ha also had the opportunity of understanding that he has poverty uh, a lot of people do think that poverty is a choice, but it's actually uh, someone like myself growing up on the south side of Chicago, having two working class parents, 
work opportunities sometimes is, is not easy. Uh, one parent having to tackle the bills when another parent has gotten laid off or is not eligible for unemployment. That's a problem when you have a household with two children in it. Um, you have one parent who's searching constantly for a job but cannot find a job because my father was a baby boomer. My father is a 50 plus age right now. And he was not able to get a high school diploma because he had to help take care of my grandmother when he was 16 and drop out of high school to work at uh, Burger King to be able to help my grandmother with her bills. So. His job opportunity was a little bit different from my mom's since she had a high school diploma. Um, even though both of them had working class jobs, it was still a little it was still a little hard. So poverty, <coughs> in my sense of a, in my sense of thinking, is not a choice because I actually come from the South Side and had two parent households. My my second um, bullet point that I have here is the fact that when you said that having a oppor making getting opportunity by moving somewhere like another state or not here in Chicago. If you can't find opportunity here in Chicago, you should move elsewhere. Well, me being of African descent, my job, finding a job that I can qualify for is not the same as somebody else who's not my race. Um, I even experienced that here. Even though I went to college and I graduated from college, I have a tremendous amount of debt because my parents could not afford to send me to college. So. After I graduated from college, I had a hard time finding a job after accumulating so much in debt just to be able to find a job because not only we live in a time where, oh, you need a high school diploma, you need an associate, you need a bachelor's, you need a master's, you need a doctorate. And even with people I know who are African American who have graduated from college with master's and doctorates, they won't qualify for jobs that they want to apply for because of their background or where they come from or their ethnicity and they have accumulated almost a quarter of a million dollars worth of debt because they didn't have backgrounds of parents who could supply, oh, you want to go to college? Let me pay for that. So I just wanted to get up here and rebuttal a little bit with what you had to say, just hoping that we can exchange some thoughts. And I do really, really, truly appreciate you and have a beautiful holiday. Okay. I guess it's my. Go ahead, Andy. Hi, as many of you know, I, I run a service. We call it database translations. You take five or ten books on a subject and translate the essence of that into a one page book notes. It's not like a summary of one book. It's like a summary of a huge database of published forensic evidence. And when you're dealing with a database, then you're outside the realm of opinion, like Rush Limbaugh saying that, uh, well, whatever, the earth is flat that day on any subject. I, I would like to take the opportunity to you know, thank Margaret for the presentation. And she stimulated us to think about some things. The minimum wage, and when I was growing up in the 60s, the minimum wage when I got my first job was around, well, it was around $2, something yeah. like that, roughly. Uh, but back then, I bought my first car, and it was $2,000. Today, your first car, if you're going to buy a new car, a starter car, is 20 grand. Back then, my next door neighbor, uh, he was a, a carpenter himself, but he had a couple of friends. They put up a small frame house. Basically, they built a house for $7,500. Wow. The house I grew up in uh, sold for about $10,000 back then. Today, that house is $300,000. Minimum wage was $2, now it's $725. The minimum wage is a third of what it would actually be compared to all the other costs of yeah. society that we have. So this talk about fighting for 15 you're fighting for two-thirds of a minimum wage, and it's barely enough. In Chicago, a young woman, Chicago Sun-Times published this a little chart a few years ago. If a woman has been homeless, she's in a homeless shelter with a child, and she has a paid-for car, to get out of a homeless shelter and rent a small apartment in Chicago and have gas and oil money to get back and forth to a job, you need between $18 and $22 an hour. You need something on the order of thirty-eight to forty thousand dollars 
if you're going to get out of a homeless shelter and take care of a child and pay for everything yourself. So um, the, the, the statistics on what wealth, so-called welfare or assistance, they're working with a poverty line that's so low that you almost have to be homeless to qualify for welfare assistance or food stamps or anything else. If you're if you're living in somebody's, you know, uh, couch, staying with a friend or something, you're living indoors. You don't qualify for a lot of assistance that's available. I mean, it, it, the VA is also a scandal. Of uh, you know, we should be asking ourselves why are there so many homeless people in America, where you don't see homeless people all over the streets of Europe. What's wrong with that picture? For one thing. Since from 1945 to 1973, we made tremendous progress because, as Margaret pointed out, businesses uh, were running under the idea that uh, workers should be paid a decent wage so they could afford to live indoors, so they could afford to send their kids to school. Um, the middle class grew solidly from 1945 to 1973. And then in 73, Lewis Powell, who became a Supreme Court Justice. I don't know if I did it, you did it, because did something. Lewis Powell put out a memo uh, talking about the Chamber of Commerce and other rich billionaires. They said, uh, the middle class is growing. When the middle class grows, you, you, a democracy grows, and they will have a tendency to vote things that will not shovel money to billionaires anymore. So we got to start taking back the, the wealth that the middle class has built up. 1973 was the watershed year. That was the highest level of prosperity for the middle class in America. And the middle class has been declining a little bit relative to cost of living and everything else since 1973. And today, one of the things we don't talk about enough is that our health care system in America is not a health care system. It's a wealth transfer system to take as much wealth from each sick person that's treated, take maximum dollars and a shovel to the billionaires in the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical and the medical industrial complex. Our, our health, so-called health care system is unique. There's nothing else like it anywhere in the world where you tell a, a sick person, uh, somebody brings a sick child in, well, uh, sign over the deed to your house and sell your house to pay the medical bills. That doesn't happen in any other country, any other modern country. We're, we're running, and also uh, the production system, like 725 an hour, workers are producing more in jobs, factories. In many cases, almost everybody here knows somebody that's doing the job of two people and getting paid for one. Where there used to be two people working, or there were six on the assembly line, and they cut it down to four or three, and they still accept the, expect the same output in production. So workers' production per eight-hour day has massively improved since 1973, but wages have just stayed flat. That money is going to the billionaires. And back in 1960, the ratio in America, the ratio of CEO pay to worker pay was about 20 to one, and in Japan they got nervous when the ratio got be up above 10 to 1. They said, if we have CEOs or business owners are making more than 10 to 12 times what the workers are making, that's going to be too much of a wealth gap. Other, in Germany, the same thing. They say, you know, the uh, workers should be getting paid what they're worth, but not here. So we have a gap today where it's 300, 400, 500 to 1, the ratio between the workers on the assembly line and the billionaires at the top, the multi-millionaires with golden parachutes. This article is called When the Unthinkable Becomes Plutonium. That means every day. It's a, I had to look up that word, but uh, give me one more minute. Um, Spell that word. Quote, Q-U-O-T-I-D-I-A-N. It means something that's quotidian. 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 It means everyday occurrence, commonplace, it's accepted as normal. And he's talking about um, climate change and everything else in America. This man's name is Phil Rockstro. He, he's published some brilliant articles over the years. He published one in 2007 called A Disneyland of Militant Ignorance. That's what America is. 
we have a third of the population that are terrifyingly militantly ignorant about real world facts, and they're militant and will get in your face and you, you, you know, they're, they're the Rush Limbaugh listeners and the Fox News watchers. The journalism schools around the country now are using Fox News as a demonstration of how you do good propaganda. If you want to keep people believing things that aren't real, just watch Fox News. That's all you have to do. So, uh, in closing, I would say, as, as the last line in this, he said that the first step, the first step in solving a problem is to call a lie a lie. If they're lying to you, call them out on it. We have to, you know, first we teach seventh graders that in science. In order to solve any problem, you have to correctly identify the problem first, and then correctly identify a solution. The solution to the south side of Chicago is not just have everybody move to where uh, on a wing and a prayer they might get a job. The solution is to fix what's wrong down there, which is the factories moved down, jobs moved down. You have a whole bunch of people living in areas where they're not even within driving distance of a job anymore, much less public transportation. That's what's changed. When we were growing up, you could walk out of high school, walk down the street in, in areas where they had factories, walk in and say, yeah. I'm an able-bodied person, uh, I'm willing to work, uh, I can I apply for a job? To, you know, it makes Today that is just simply impossible, virtually anywhere in America. There's 10 people looking for a job where there's one opening all over this country because the jobs have been moved by the uh, 60, 70,000 factories have been moved overseas. Millions and millions of good paying middle class jobs aren't in this country anymore. Honeywell bragged about 22 million, 22,000 new engineering jobs they created a couple years ago. Somebody asked, well, where are those jobs? 22,000 engineering jobs, good paying jobs. They're in India. They're not here. So if, if we're going to address the problem of the runaway billionaires, the first thing we have to do, you know, the very first thing is to not let the situation become normal. It's not normal that we have a corporate criminal con man masquerading as our president. That's not normal and we shouldn't accept it as normal and there's a whole bunch of websites that say this is not normal and we're not going to accept it. There was an article on Common Greens a week ago that said we just passed a year without a president. And we're headed toward another year with no president, and that's and that's the reality of the situation. To, to address Trump as the president is a gross distortion of the human language. That's it. And you know, if you're reality based, start logging on to Common Dreams every day. That one news site is the best of the best. Common Dreams, Truth Out, and the Smirking Chimp. Those three sites give you a panorama of reality based articles every day. It's, it's amazing what's on those sites. And it's uh, you know constant updating news, just like the 24-hour cable news, but <coughs> these sites are being updated with really good stuff. Okay, thank you. Anybody wants any more information, come see me at the back. Isn't that a new I, uh, <laughs> I find it utterly amazing that all of you have kind of forgotten a little something about what's been happening in the world in the last 20 years. It's called globalization. And I think it's been a good thing. There have been a lot of jobs lost. But I guarantee you, if you go back to school, learn something like coding or some other stuff, uh, you'll probably learn. I'm going to introduce into the record one of my favorite series, an economist by the name of Johann Norberg. He does these little snippets of video called That You're Dead Wrong. And I'm going to introduce into the record now his review, his views on the causes of poverty reduction. It's only about a minute 18, and I'll follow up with some rebuttals of my own after he speaks. I can get the thing to work here. To start over here. Yeah, crackpot No, he's not a crackpot libertarian, Charlie. He's probably one of the most one of the most uh, how shall I say enlightened economists in the world. He's not a crackpot. Here we go. Point out that world poverty is declining faster than ever, but that's not because of free markets. It's because of government redistribution. Nope, that's the problem. 
The people over at Our World in Data, which, by the way, is a wonderful project and you should really look into it, they recently published this chart which shows how social spending distribution. Nope, that's their problem. The people over at Our World in Data, which, by the way, is a wonderful project and you should really look into it, they recently published this chart which shows how social spending increased in Western countries dramatically after the 1950s. So the amazing reduction in poverty took place while redistribution increased to an all-time high, more than a story of free market capitalism, as they put it. Pretty convincing, until you realize that they're talking about two different groups of countries. Social spending increased dramatically in rich countries, but the simultaneous poverty reduction took place in the poor countries. So the interesting question is, when did extreme poverty decline in the now rich countries? Well, it started decreasing in the mid-19th century as the Industrial Revolution increased incomes. In 1900, it was below 20%. And in the next few decades, it all but disappeared. Extreme poverty was gone from the Western world before the welfare state. Mostly a story about free market capitalism, mm -hmm. after all. You see, mostly what's happened when you have poverty reduction is free market capitalism delivers the goods. You see, what happens is we all want jobs, we all want poverty reduction. Let's do something really innovative that, and get this our and get ourselves off global warming, get ourselves as with some real energy power, and let's go back and take a good long hard look at nuclear, specifically the next generation of molten salt thorium reactors that I've been talking about for a long time. When you have a cheap source of energy. You have real poverty reduction. People want things like washing machines, like motors, and like this. And if you environmentalists think that uh, we're going to do it by, you know, not having a good cheap source of energy, you're dead wrong. And if you really want jobs in this country, the first thing you have to do, I believe, is educate yourself, learn what you're good at, and then try to make a living at what you're good at. Easily said, hard to do. A lot of us go through a lot of, hard, of trouble getting ourselves educated. Like I said, you were just pointed out, one of your friends took almost a quarter million dollars in debt, which is about the, the uh, thing of the, of, the, of the homes and everything else. What we really should be looking at is the corporate welfare given to companies and colleges and things like this. You really want to get rid of the welfare state, get rid of these special exemptions to industry and let them pay their fair share. Yes, I'm a free marketer. And yes, I don't like welfare. But I don't see any comparison between somebody who needs it to get by and we're all worried about the welfare cheats when at the same time you have a company like Walmart or some of these other large corporations that are actively having to have their full-time employees on food stamps. You know, we should have some some good things happening and yes i generally don't like a union on principles but sometimes they're absolutely necessary even even in the early teens we had this problem of the rising inequality of people and the only way we were really able to do it was when the union started coming in and demanding good pay for good jobs now our, our we started it off in the 20s because once they got, once the corporations figured out that people who make a little extra money at the capitalist lower end actually buy things, then that's when we really started getting things off. My prescription for the best way to handle, you know, the businesses and the big massive giveaways that Trump just gave to all of the big billionaires in this country, you know, let's get our tax system fair again. Maybe not so much a regressive tax, but maybe just a flat tax or maybe some kind of other, there's a new plethora of other ways for government to raise money. You know, we used to do it through tariffs and things like this, but now we got competition, folks. The United States is no longer the big boy on the block anymore. We have a rising power called China with their one belt, one road policy. We heard it here from Mr. Liu a few weeks ago and what China's doing to help build their status 
is to become a world trading partner. We have Mr. Putin in Russia trying to reassert himself. Now, what's the best way to deal with them? Trade. Fair trade and free trade and open trade. We're much better talking and doing commerce than fighting. Thank you. And again, Charlie, you're dead wrong. I'll show you when we get back. Okay. Just, um, I uh, would like to thank all of you. Do we have any more rebutters yet? Okay, come on up. I just want to say, because you know, uh, the economy and everything, uh, things have changed over the years. He said he bought a car for two thousand dollars, the house was eight thousand, but the price of oil, nineteen seventy-three or seventy-four, was two dollars a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> Overnight, that price went up four, six, eight, quadruple it up. I think mean, in the it was the nineteen nineties or in the early two thousand one hundred two twenty dollars or something. Just two thousand eight. I mean, that's made the change and everything. I mean, he had globalization, <coughs> his competition, very much. Mm -hmm. How do we keep up with all this stuff? You know, <clears throat> there's other people uh, competing with us, too. So that's the big difference in our economy. Yeah, we, we, we are no longer the only manufacturing economy in the world like we were after World War II. Uh, just a quick update of uh, what he just said. Uh, Tim was absolutely right. At one time, <laughs> nuclear power was cheaper than everything. Uh, more or less. That was back in uh, the, 60s. the 70s when it was e uh, heavily subsidized. But nuclear power used to be cheaper than solar when solar was $18, $18 uh, well, $1,800 for a 300 watt panel. It cost $1,800 in 1988. Today it costs 150 Like cheap cell phones, cheap laptops, these kinds of things, uh, solar and wind is now vastly cheaper than any other source of energy on the planet cheaper than oil everywhere. So, talking about getting jobs in America, right now, for those of you that haven't heard the statistic, there's more people employed in the solar energy industry mm -hmm. than in the fossil fuel industry yep. in America. And it's growing fast. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So, do it's an all on above strategy. Story, let's go with what we have now rather than trying to develop something that might help us 15 years from now. Well, tr there's okay. three companies now developing these thorium reactors that have just gone public. Okay. And there's more coming. It's not this, your father's nuclear. <laughs> hey, um, two things. First of all, this week uh, it was just reported that 700 employees were uh, making reports on the danger of nuclear energy, and they were silenced. Um, they sought whistleblower protection because they wanted to alert the citizens of the United States as to the inherent dangers of the 61 currently operating nuclear power plants in the United States. That's more whistleblowers than, and I've not researched this, that exceeds the number of whistleblowers in the entire federal government for about a 10 year period on one topic. Uh, the other thing is, very quickly, um, regarding, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, who supplies our gifts? Either Santa Claus, there's one thing about Santa Claus supplying gifts is that you're good, everyone's going to get a gift. It might not be the greatest gift or anything, but everybody is going to get a gift every year. This is why the government plan, Chuck's government plan is, is, is I, I'm telling you, might work. Now, with Margaret's mom and dad plan, you might get a real nice gift, a really cool, really, really nice gift, but you might not get no gift at all. You might not know, get no gift at all for several years. You might get a real nice gift for several, several years, but that's your choice. And the only and way you're gonna be able to enforce it so by force. That's, now, the other thing about globalization that's gotta stand corrected, and I want to leave you something to think about in okay. 2018, because you're my friend. Mm -hmm. But the thing about globalization is, the wages, we're talking about the wages. Now, whatever you can find, somebody is willing to work and to make this, 
that's going to set the wages yeah. worldwide. So if I can find somebody who's willing to make this for 10 cents a day, that's going to set the wages for making this around the world. And he wants to do this. That's. Do you realize what you're saying? I know exactly the what I'm saying, Charlie. The lowest that someone is willing to accept in order to form the work to make this will set the standard for everyone else. And once they got and this these, is what you want. Yes, the it's low, exactly the race to the God. I, I because Charlie, I'll the tell the you why. Worst of all possible worlds. Thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you why, Charlie. The lowest. You need to look at the case of New Zealand. All right, let's get uh, Margaret gets the last word. Here's the update from Margaret. All right, Margaret, please. We <laughs> promise no heckling. Um, okay, okay. Uh, just repeating some of the good points I heard. Um, wars are never really won, and um, the peace uh, you have to struggle for. Uh, that there is not a left-right uh, division. I disagree. I think we do have a serious problem. I read about it all the time. Divisiveness in the society, and that's why we can't get um, folks in Congress working together. It is bad. It all goes back to, and I won't go into um, fil not filibusters, what do I want to say? The, um, I can't think of the word. Anyway, when they with withdraw the um, Congressional uh, districts of Fairland. Philip, what? Gerrymandering. Gerrymandering. That was it. Uh, and uh, we should organize for peace. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, uh, Jean said, I'm glad I'm not young. I agree with that because, to be honest with you, I, and I don't care what part of the city or who you are, I think young people are really at a disadvantage. You've got to look towards your lifetime, $20 trillion national debt. You've got to hope that you're going to not be living the way people live in Greece. Okay. Uh, we have... Um, uh, the two incomes are needed, uh, depending on the situation. I don't believe that. I don't believe that people have to have children if they don't think they can make it on one income. There's such a thing as planning. There's such a thing as waiting until you're 30. All right, okay, so people are going to say, well, everybody goes to grad school, blah, blah, blah. But technically, you could wait until 30, have your kids, save money for that period when you're working in your 20s, have that as a um, something to fall back on for, let's say, when the husband is working, bring home the bread, then the mom can stay home till the kids go to kindergarten, and you know, that would be the ideal way. Uh, Vax, given, I was uh, accused of not using facts. I'm very much a facts-based person. I very much I get upset when I hear people that don't use facts. I mentioned the sources of my facts, so that was a very unfair comment. I, I never mentioned welfare recipient. I never brought up the subject of welfare. It wasn't part of the topic, but anyway. Uh, and uh, the 24% the uh, defined contributions and get to Define contribution with contribution. Now, that's an important point, and I do feel sorry. Again, this goes to getting to your younger generations, when they don't have people that my generation have are defined contribution benefits, and that's one thing that we, we can fall back on. Uh, the poverty of circumstances, Charlie, I do not agree with that, except that what this young lady said from the South Side, I can understand. That is a problem, sir. I mean, your, your case is like believable. But not from this Lithuanian over here. Uh, Lithuanians are not, no. It applies to them around the world. Uh, we're talking now about the U.S., by the way. Um, 
And uh, you're talking about reducing anxiety by having things handed to you, Charlie. Let me tell you the best way to reduce anxiety is to take the, the um, uh, what's the expression? The um, bull by the horns. Oh, I thought you were going to say revolution. <laughs> you get your hands. You sit down and you have a problem, and believe me, I've had every possible problem imaginable. You sit down and you grapple with it and you put this and you try this and this and you succeed and that is the best way in the world to avoid anxiety because you have yourself, you can rely on yourself. You cannot rely on other people, especially the government. And I know that the government there, talk about you run to rely on the government for something, you're relying on nothing. And, uh, and yeah, yes, government is not Santa Claus, well, by the way. The federal government is Florida. not Santa Claus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> again, I appreciate it. The young lady's presentation from the South Side, yes, it's good getting that point of view because obviously I haven't lived on the South Side and experienced, you know, the life you have. I'm not even from Chicago. I mean, I, so I, you know, but things are quite different where I came from and all that. Um, that uh, and as Andy correctly said, 1945 to 1973 was kind of the golden age for uh, blue collar workers and their single, you know, one or families and all that. And this business of the CEOs getting so much more now compared to average workers than they used to. That's horrible. Um, now, this is a myth, and we need to really explode this myth. The loss of manufacturing jobs, and I have statistics at home, and I'll supply them to anybody who wants to call me up, and I will give them to them. The vast majority of manufacturing jobs are lost to automation, yep. not to flight overseas. That's right. Now, you really got to look, let's really, because otherwise, That's how are we going to fight the source of this loss of jobs. We've got to put the, our foot down. The federal government subsidizes changing, you know, in research and development of automation. So they, they, in fact, with this new legislation, I think they're going to make investment you pay off even more. So we're probably losing more jobs. I mean, again and again, I read, I read the statistics. They don't believe, they, they believe that 46% of existing jobs now will be automated away and everybody sits around blaming exports? Come on, let's get the facts. Let's get down to the real culprit. One one study. Baloney, Charlie, she's yes, talking. She knows what she's talking yes. about. Thank you. No, one study. All right, few more points. Yeah, Let me finish. Oh, in fact, one that is, at a time, Charlie. And then, and then um, Tim says that globalization is good. And I believe, in general, like so many of these things, they're good if you put keep them under control, you know, and if you have the proper regulation. You just can't let everything run wild. You have to, um, but it doesn't say that globalization in and of itself is bad. It is good. It has brought prosperity to other countries, which is a humane thing to do. You have countries like Brazil that in this period have become industrialized countries. I mean, they're having a lot of problems now, but you've got a middle class here that wasn't there. The same thing with China. China has been, I mean, vast millions, billions, well, millions of people who have been brought out of poverty in third world countries by globalization. How can you be against that? Like Bangladesh clothing companies? No, Charlie, she's talking about the third of the population in China that's gotten out of abject poverty. As, as I said, misquoting you her about the clothing companies in Bangladesh. That's only because, Charlie, they're That's on a stepping wonderful. stone to prosperity now. Yeah. They'll, go to the, they'll go to the next lowest country that buys their wages up there. Guys, let, me, the heck down. let me tell you a funny story. You people, Charlie, I mean, All right. talks about losing textile jobs to third world countries. I'm from New England, which was a big textile area. My own family, my grandfather, he had, no, great, great, great grandfather, had a textile factory in Rhode Island. Okay, and around the 1920s and 30s, all of that textile business went to the southern part of the United States. You think people were out demonstrating in the streets because the textile industry 
left it. No, only because it goes to a foreign country. It doesn't matter that it went to the southern part of the United States. That's okay. I mean, this is like, I don't know, That's this okay. nationalistic thing. This is Trump. Well, is this is Trump okay? and this nationalism. I mean, it's okay. All right, I think that's it. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. I need a, a ride to, can anyone give me a ride to Western Avenue? Yes, I will, Margaret. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rep. Merry Christmas. Okay, that's, that's all for the National Academy of Colleges. We are hoping to see you next week. We're going to be here soon. We're out. Thank you. 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 He's older than I am. I don't remember him. Oh, I remember him.